if there's one thing that could be said about the toy industry is it is consistently inconsistent. Welcome back to the Spectra Creative Channel. I'm your host, Scott, toy guru, Nightlick, and I started this channel, well, partially out of boredom because of COVID, but also because I realized I could provide a unique perspective to fellow toy fans. I'm a toy fan, but I am also have been blessed with being able to work in the toy industry. And I know a lot of things in the toy industry just seem inconsistent, and they seem like they don't make sense. So I want to try to shed some light on that. That's part of why this whole channel exists. But this video in particular, lately I've been getting a lot of comments and a lot of feedback, and very positive, but asking questions about items going to retail and why some items can go to retail and others can't, why some items are pre-sold online, others go right to retail. So I want to use this video as a catch-all net. And I know, I know, take a drink, the drink, the Spectra Creative drinking game, because I'm talking about planograms again. But the reason is because this is the soul of retail. This is where it all happens. Planograms are what are designed by retailers and manufacturers to maximize shelf space in order to move the most number of units. And this is all done way, way in advance. It's done when toy lines are pitched to retail which happens about two years before product actually shows up. It's a huge process. You can't just magically get a line to retail and say, hey, Walmart, Target, Toys R Us, I have this item. Why don't you take it? It has to fit in, and this takes time. Now, planograms are switched over twice a year, usually in February and August, and they have a six-month like life at retail. End caps, on the other hand, which are outside the aisle, that's the area facing towards the uh, the runway, if you will, is what's called in retail, not actually in the aisle, these are switched over much more, about every three weeks, sometimes more, sometimes less. And they're usually always tied to a major tentpole event, such as an anniversary, a movie release, something like that. But again, just like a planogram, uh, everything done on an end cap is also planned out two years ahead of time, and you have to pitch for these end caps. You have to make the case of why you deserve to have an end cap two years before the end cap happens. They don't just give it to you. You have to have a reason, and you have to make a compelling argument. So when you have large items, and sorry to drag this one up again, but I've been getting so many comments on it, and I want to clarify. The new Super 7 Thunder Tank, which is a very large item that's very expensive, and it's on a pre-order only, the idea that you could just make this and just say, hey, retail, I have this big item, take it. Well, it doesn't work like that. The, the, everything is already spoken for as far as in aisle and end caps. Items that just come along as a flavor of the month don't work at retail. And you might say, well, wait a minute, retail has had a lot of success with Thundercats. Thundercats has been at retail as a collector line in the past. So if something like this, if something like a really big Thunder Tank comes along, surely you could use that to anchor a new Thundercats statement at retail. After all, it's an evergreen brand, right? It's been around since the 80s. So the question is, okay, why were those previous Thundercats figures available at retail, but the current line is only available online through Super 7? Same thing with Masters of the Universe Classics. This was a brand that I brand managed at Mattel, and I was very adamant about how this line does not work at retail and that we needed to sell it online, and there were many reasons for that. And again, people say, well, wait a minute, Scott. Masters of the Universe Origins at retail. That proves that He-Man works at retail. So, you know, the fact that you said Masters of the Universe Classic doesn't work at retail, well, if anything... That proves you are a liar, liar, pants on fire. He-Man doesn't really wear pants. He only has like those little shorts. That would be really bad if his pants were on fire. All right, so it's all about context. And viewing how a toy is accepted by retail is all about not just how it's presented, but what's happening in the industry, in pop culture, and with retail at the time the line is pitched to them. So as an example with Masters of the Universe, when we were doing classics, it was right on the coattails of the 2000X series, which I love. This is one of my favorite pieces of He-Man content. Now, while we love it, retail, not so much. They did not see it as the wild success that collectors saw it as, and they were basically ready to drop it. Granted, there were collector-only SKUs, but these were offered not at retail, but at conventions. 
but they had the effect of convincing a lot of collectors that Masters of the Universe 2000X, or Mike Young, whatever you're going to call it, was designed for the collector. And that is not a good interpretation. Yes, a few skews were for collectors, like this one, but the grand line, the, the, the vast majority of SKUs were 100% kid-aimed. It's why you got things like this showing up at retail, the, you know, the fun disco Skeletor repaint. This was not designed for collectors at all. In fact, nothing at retail was designed for collectors. It was just a bonus if collectors were also buying it, which, of course, no one's going to say no to those sales, but it's a misnomer to think this line was designed for collectors. So the 2000X line, from a retail standpoint and from a manufacturer, from Mattel standpoint, it was a failure. It had a bad stink to it. The brand did not do well, and it had to be cleared out on clearance. So along comes Masters of the Universe Classics not long after. Call it a short reboot, sort of like uh, Spider-Man. Every time he has a movie series, he gets rebooted, like a year later. So pitching this to retail, which we did, retail was like, Heck no, it was under the shadow of the most recent Masters of the Universe, and that was viewed as a failure. The memory, the most recent memory for retailers and for manufacturers, Mattel, management, was that Masters of the Universe no longer works. It's not a brand that can be sustained at retail. And yeah, I know a few items snuck out because the uh, discount team grabbed them from me before I could say no and set up like 27 end caps in the whole country, but that's not the point. When we brought it to retail and said, hey, would you like a new Masters of the Universe line, this time aimed more at the collector, the demographic that did like the 2000X series, well, the collector doesn't have enough sales or not enough of us to justify it. So then the question is, okay, well, what's different about Origins? Why is Origins at retail? Again, context. Within the context of Origins, when it was pitched to retail, now the most recent Masters of the Universe line was a success. Granted, it wasn't at retail, it was online through Maddie Collector and Super 7, but overall, it is that the brand has now become a success in the eyes of retailers and the manufacturer, Mattel or Super 7 or Universal, whoever owns the copyright at this time. So the shift between a brand being viewed as a failure and a brand being viewed as a success can change based on what happens. Classics is directly responsible for shifting that viewpoint. So let's look at Thundercats because it's a slightly different example but the same results. Bandai put out a line of collector figures. First they did them an 8 inch and then they realized that was a mistake and shrunk them to 6 inch. So those were at retail, but now the new Super 7 line, which is the same scale, is only online and has this giant Thunder Tank that they're asking people to pre-order for. Again, it's all about context. So you can't just put the, the, the tank at retail. The last time Thunder, Thunder Cats was at retail, it had an animated series. And in the industry, the retail industry and the, and the toy industry, content is king. It's all about content. Retailers are, for the most part, especially in the main aisle, not that collector thing behind electronics, they're only interested in carrying SKUs if there's content, which means a TV show and marketing money to do TV commercials. So the line that accompanied the Bandai Collector Thundercats had a robust retail line. Figures, deluxe figures, it had a hook. The hook was the content, and there was going to be marketing dollars behind it. So a collector line could be sold adjunctively, meaning it's not just sold as a collector line, it's sold in addition to the main line. An example that I worked on, and I've brought this up before, I know, again, drinking game for Spectra Creative when I say something again, when we did the Green Lantern movie line, adjunctively to the four feet of movie product, we did one foot of collector product. It was part of an overall statement. So a perfect example of this is the current Hasbro's Ghostbuster line, which is at retail. And again, people are saying, well, wait a minute, Ghostbusters clearly works at retail. I mean, heck, it was even at retail when Mattel worked on it, when they did a Walmart line with the Maddie Collector tools. Well, yeah, it's not really the same thing. Because when we were doing the Maddie Collector line, and, you know, so people saying, well, why couldn't you sell that at retail? When clearly when Hasbro puts out the product, it goes right to retail. In fact, it's on an end cap right now. Well, one, this end cap is a clearance end cap to move things. But the point is, the current line at retail is tied directly to content. There was supposed to be a movie. 
the movie got pushed out because of obvious corona issues, but there was a much, much larger retail statement that was attached to Ghostbusters, and most of it got pushed out. A few things snuck out, like the Hasbro collector line. When we did the line on Maddie Collector, there was no current content, so it could only be sold online. Retail wasn't interested in it because there was no film. So essentially, the lack of content, the lack of a movie or TV show, or the failure of the most recent content are basically the two big reasons retailers say no to having a property in their aisle. The aisle space is extremely limited and extremely competitive. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of companies that want to be in this space. So think of a movie or content as the boat that delivers items to retail. In fact, think of the boat as the, the movie line, and then it tows a smaller boat that is the collector line behind it. The collector line gets to retail because the bigger boat is, is towing it. So with G.I. Joe Classified, another good example, this is at retail because it was supposed to be towed by a larger boat. The larger boat being the Snake Eyes movie, which again, like the Ghostbusters movie, got pushed out because of Corona. If the Snake Eyes movie had come out, it would have had a toy line that would have justified the retail space for, for classified. So as an adult collector, and I'm one of them, we basically have to shift our perspective. We look at toys and action figures as for us, and they're made for us, and why won't retailer you know, accommodate us? You know, We are the center of everything, and emotionally, we're very attached to this product, myself included. Believe me, I've waited in front of enough Targets and Toys R Us's at 8 in the morning over the years. So essentially, a retailer is going to look at it very differently. They look at product just based on profit, loss, and will it sell or will it not? And that's how you have to look at it and how it's tied to content and how it's tied to the most recent content. I hope this video clarified. If you like this content, please do subscribe and give it a like because that tells YouTube to share it with more people. Leave your comments below. I love to respond to them and I'll see you in the next video.